But let's sort of go back and uh, talk about this anti-MOG uh, variety of NMO. So Rod, uh, tell us about that, especially in children. Yeah, so the MOG story actually dates back a little bit earlier where um, it was thought to be using uh, antibodies against MOG were thought to be maybe somehow uh, protective or a treatment for MS. And actually what was found was that MOG uh, was found to be used in an experimental model causing experimental autoimmune encephalitis. So an animal model of MS uh, subsequently, the antibody became available a few years ago, more commercially and in research purposes several years before that. And what was noted is a group of patients who had optic neuritis that often was very responsive to steroids were found to have these positive antibodies. Exactly what their role in the pathogenesis of optic neuritis is, is not clear, but it is a marker in a group of patients, and that includes younger patients, uh, pediatric patients who develop optic neuritis. In our experience, it's probably about a third at Texas Children's Hospital of patients who develop optic neuritis, uh, who are children, will have uh, MOG antibodies present. And they can signify in older patients a risk for recurrent optic neuritis, or what was previously termed cryon for chronic relapsing idiopathic optic neuritis. So now we have a spectrum of disease that initially was only considered to be MS, and now it's branched at least into two other forms, MOG and NMO. Right. And one of the tips offs for MOG disease that we've seen is a lot of swelling on fundoscopic examination. Uh, the old teaching about optic neuritis was the patient couldn't see anything and when the doctor looked in the optic nerve looked normal they couldn't see anything but if you see a patient who fits the clinical profile of optic neuritis and that optic nerve is swollen and there are hemorrhages the index suspicion for nmo goes up very high and also for anti-mog uh, I admit all these patients now so that I can get the imaging of the core done right away. I can see their response. And if by three days of IV steroids, they're not better, I give them two more days. And if they're not better then, I'm looking at phoresis. Uh, how about you, Rod? Yeah, I was going to ask you the same thing. And I say after five days, sometimes six, um, if they are not better, then we look to plasmapheresis them. And they are especially the pediatric cases that routinely admitted, one of the things that I'll look for is an early response to treatment. So we talked about uh, a lack of response as being a marker maybe for NMO. One of the things that we'll see with MOG is a very rapid response. So if you're getting a visual recovery within 24 to 48 hours with IV steroids, I'm very suspicious with MOG, for MOG. The other thing is, on MRI with MOG, there tends to be this tendency for a perineural enhancement pattern. So if you're seeing enhancement of the optic nerve that's extending into the orbital fat or around the optic nerve sheath rather than just the nerve itself, that's a strong indication that you might be dealing with MOG or at least another type of inflammatory optic neuropathy. So I would predict the following. Uh, when I was in medical school, before we had MRI and before we had a lot of things, I won't go into many more details about the, how long ago that was, uh, we thought multiple sclerosis was a rare disease. Uh, that is not true. And that happened because of MRI. Anytime we get better technology, we become better clinicians and can more precisely treat patients. The teaching literally five years ago was that NMO and anti-MOG were rare. Um, I think they're common. Rod, what do you think? Yeah, they're certainly common in our practices. Um, I think, you know, we didn't even have MOG commercially available to us until a couple of years ago. So now we're seeing a rash of it. I've seen in the past few months at Texas Children's, a handful of cases. So clearly much more common than we thought. And maybe years from now, we'll be doing this again and there'll be another antibody that further subdivides mm. this group of conditions. Yeah. And you know, Rob mentioned lumpers and splitters and uh, 
In the short term, the lumpers are always right. In the long term, the splitters are always right. So I would take that approach. And I think Rod's comments here about other antibodies is very insightful. Uh, Rod, do you have Lyme disease in Texas? Uh, we test for it. You know, I ordered it yesterday, but I was telling the resident that, you know, he, he had trained in New York and said, yeah, we got it all the time. You know, the reality is travel, uh, barring COVID-19, is so common these days that you can be in an endemic area in the Northeast and come into Texas, but it's not part of our armamentarium to look for Lyme here very often. Well, there's no shortage of hunters in Texas. And uh, while, uh, uh, you know, Lyme disease was first described in Connecticut, it's now almost the state disease of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So depending on where you practice, uh, makes a difference. Uh, so if we talk about infectious optic neuritis, uh, Lyme is there and we test for it all the time because the treatments are different. And, uh, you know, penicillin and antibiotics help this. Uh, Rod, bilateral disease, and we have a finding in neuro-ophthalmology of seeing cells in the vitreous. Uh, what can be easily overlooked that we thought, uh, you know, uh, doesn't happen that much, but we see several cases a year that responds to penicillin. Yeah, and so, I would add in there for us, cat scratch disease, especially yeah. in the pediatric population. So I'm always looking for vitritis, the uveitis, because that really tilts your thinking. It should tilt your thinking into infectious or some other inflammatory response. We don't see that with NMO, MOG, and typical MS for the most part. And uh, of course, the syphilis is in there. Uh, so again, everybody, everybody uh, uh, gets a, a test for syphilis. And if you find that, you know, it's, uh, it's obviously a different treatment. You will not hurt a patient with syphilis by treating them with steroids, uh, but you won't help them either. So you've got to be always careful about that.